Welcome to an interview episode of Cannabis Last Week, as I like to call them, Connotable, spelled C-A-N-N, of course, because I appreciate puns, as you know from the podcast. I'm your host, John Pirro. This is brought to you by Global Cannabis Times. Now, before we get to an awesome interview, I just want to note that any opinions I express are my own and not those of my law firm, Zuber Lawler. Um, For example, if I was to say that Paul Rosen uh, is a titan of the cannabis industry, that would be my own opinion. But actually, everyone in Zuber Lawler would agree. So maybe not the best example. But, you know, and before we start, I want to do my customary quick prayer to the video chat gods. May our Wi-Fi connections be sturdy. Our dogs and children may remain quiet. And may Amazon Prime another time. Um, amen. And without further ado, I have the pleasure of introducing the one and only Paul Rosen, um, CEO and chairman of 1933 Industries, though he's a man of many hats and many titles. So, Paul, first off, I just want to say thank you for joining. Oh, it's such a sincere pleasure to be here with you, John. Uh, Thank you for having me. Yeah. Actually, you know what? I owe you another thank you, right? Because Paul, um, to the audience, uh, Paul was actually really instrumental and helpful before the podcast got launched um, when we were doing test runs and everything. And you were kind enough to donate your time to doing it. And you are the reason why the podcast episodes have the golden nug. Um, I call them that the deep dive stories that because you, like me, are obsessive about this industry and read all of the news. And like I think you, you said you like keep a notebook where you sketch down some of these deep cut stories and stuff. So you know we share that love of the industry, that love of identifying the stories that are the, I guess maybe the tip of the spear is the expression, right? That they're you, where you see the trend starting. Uh, and then, you know, it's kind of satisfying when you see it play out, right? Um, I think you could probably appreciate that, you know, more than anyone. So, you know, anyways, um, thank you for that. Um, that is a, you're only one who gets that, thank you. Um, so we are doing a little bit different. We are going to riff. We're going to, you know, I think it's going to be more of the, this is going to be the curb your enthusiasm interview of my interviews, right? Yeah. Where I have like a couple little notes. You don't even have it. You're not even the actor that Larry David is handing, you know, the notes to that we're going to improvise off of. You are pure, as you said, and requested, you are pure jazz, improvisational jazz. So you are the person with all your knowledge. I want to talk about the, the, the golden nug type stories, the ones that I see and I think it could be end up being huge. So the first one um, that I think is actually also an interesting coincidence because one of the companies at the forefront of it is a company that you were <laughs> quite closely associated with is the story about how you know, now there's an increasing focus in society and in the industry specifically about the energy consumption of all these grows, um, the effects on the environment. And so one of the things that I found was really interesting was when you're reading these stories about these, um, say these labs, right? That I think that there are at least two or three different companies or scientists, universities that are moving forward with models where say yeast, right? Can just crank out specific cannabinoids. And this is interesting for the environmental reasons. This is interesting for the ability to produce larger quantities of the minor cannabinoids than occur in the plant normally. And, you know, we're, we're just scratching it's the tip of the iceberg of hundred cannabinoids and we barely tinkered around with, you know, five to seven. Um, and, you know, the other example, I think of this, right. And I'm going to call this section, the um, cannabinoids uh, grown outside of the plant, right. The, the full plant, you know, harvesting process. There's also this Canadian and Israeli company that generated biomass um, in a decent sized quantity um, that was able to contain um, specific cannabinoids. Oh, and also it's predictability, right? They could predict the quantities that they're going to getting where by comparison, you know, like the THC content and the same strain seeds planted in Oregon and California will have different, you know, um, content. So with all that, that long-winded intro, <laughs> I'm curious to know your thoughts about how this process is going, you know, and or how you think this could impact the industry down the road, basically anything. 
improvise jazz. We are talking about biosynthesis, I believe. Yes. yes. To create standardized cannabinoids outside of the plant, to use your very uh, accurate and elegant turn of phrase. I first sort of peaked up or perked my interest uh, into this still nascent space uh, in 2015 uh, through a Canadian company based in Montreal called Hyacinth, uh, which was the first company I ever came across that indicated that they had figured out, started by a, a graduate student chemist at McGill University, I think, a guy named Kevin Chen, pretty young at the time, but pretty brilliant and sort of unpacked the scientific process where they could produce THC, CBG, CBN, et cetera, et cetera. But to your, your meta point here on a very small scale, uh, but ultimately lowest cost, if you will, greatest standardization and without a doubt, the least uh, deleterious impact on the environment, the fragile uh, environment. And I think Years later, now we can say, where did this go? And Kronos Group bought, exactly. invested in Ginkgo Bioworks. Ginkgo is a really incredible company. As, aside from the cannabinoid, they do all sorts of very interesting, um, uh, really development of mo novel molecules or, or simulated molecules, but all over the map, but partly also towards cannabis. So right now we are, you know, we're probably reaching a point where the, um, we're going from theoretical to commercial, we're just at that inflection point right now. And I will say that there is definitely, uh, my first sense is this will disrupt the market, but like all things in cannabis, predictions are a f mugs game. You tend to, I mean, not that they're wrong, but they're often early because everything just seems to take twice as long. And, you know, as we say, cost twice as much, but in regards to biosynthesis, yeah, I think there's a place for them in our marketplace. What I'm going to posit, John, is that it's really going to create the APIs for the pharmaceutical industry to, to come in large. I really see that. I don't see when, you know, quote unquote, a big pharma comes in, um and wants to start um harvesting the miracle of this plant to create you know patented protected defendable um therapies um l largely i don't think they're going to want to grow plants to source their apis now i'm fully aware that gw pharmaceutical or jazz now does grow plants uh, which is the api that goes into epidiolex the only fda yep medication and i'm going to say that's just because biosynthesis wasn't available yet it just makes sense to me uh, and you hit upon something very important is that for it to be for big pharma to embrace it they need to know that if you will every gel cap or every capsule or every injection is exactly the same like completely the same and we know that those of us that are have you know, been growing, if you will, not ourselves, but like I'm a CEO of a cultivation company. Uh, we know that even if we do everything to create a standardized environment, there will be variants from not only one crop to the next, but even where you harvest the, the bud, if you will. So it's great for the recreational market because there's a very artisanal sort of like, you know, crafty kind of thing, but not really so great for the big pharma. So I think without a doubt, biosynthesis is the real deal without a doubt i don't necessarily i could see it fitting in not just into big pharma but also big cpg so again let's say that one day coca-cola wants to have a beverage that has a minor cannabinoid in it cbn cbg maybe cbd maybe even thc one day given coca-cola is to put cocaine in the beverage why not <laughs> i still think they're going to be more likely when they're running a big automated assembly line that they're going to want to minimize the variance from a key ingredient. So I'm sure Coke's SOPs for sugar are probably incredible just to ensure standardization or anything else. If the plant can achieve that standardization, great, but I, I doubt it probably will. So that's where I see it coming in over time to be a API for big pharma for sure, as they make cannabis cannabinoid based therapies, or an ingredient for big CPG when they just want to minimize the risk. 
and they want to, you know, it's not that they, the big CPG doesn't rely upon plants all the time to grow. I had coconut butter this morning that comes from coconut. Obviously there is some, you know, uh, flexibility on this. It's not going to be all or nothing, but it's coming, it's real and it's environmentally far superior without a doubt. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, you touched upon so many interesting topics there that I kind of want to um, respond, bounce off question and everything. I look in general, right, not just for the pharmaceutical companies, the idea of, you know, consistency of experience, right, is important up and down for every product in this market, right, you know, and certainly more so for some than others like beverages, right, I mean, but they're and that touches upon one of the other uh, things that I find really, really interesting is the fact that it's becoming increasingly clear and the people in the know, right, know that sativa versus indica shorthand for what you're going to feel afterwards is bullshit, right? And what really matters more are terpene profiles, but people's individual, you know, biochemistry reacts to these things differently. And it's, you know, not as easy to turn terpene profiles into shorthand for the kind of curious when they're encountering, countering a product. And so, but, you know, certainly what you said, the consistency matters the most to pharmaceutical companies and people on that level who are starting to come in and will absolutely obviously come into a crazy, much larger extent with their money and resources, you know, post-federal legalization. Um, and by the way, I didn't circle back, right? I made the, uh, I referenced, you know, how it was a company that you had some association with, you mentioned them, right? But the specific reason why is that my golden nug story, maybe two months ago at this point, was that the Kronos group was the first group to release, a uh, first company to release a product that had a biosynthesized cannabinoid um, through their, I think actually it was a, an IP license um, with another company, um, one of the other big boys uh, who does a lot of stuff in this, and I'm, it's escaping me right now, one of the other big Canadian companies. And it was CBG, um, right? So that is something, you know, for the people who don't know, for the, um, as I now call them in the podcast, since I came up with the idea two years ago, the dupe noobs, the newbies to the industry, the dupe newbies, um, CBG is like the stem cell of cannabinoids to some extent, right? It occurs early in the life cycle of the plant. And then as the plant proceeds, converts, you know, quite frequently into other, um, to other cannabinoids, THC, CBD specifically in most common instances, uh, and only remains in trace amounts. But CBG is a pretty remarkable cannabinoid in terms of what we've already seen from the research. And for me personally, having uh, had, you know, hemp with uh, genetically engineered with high CBG content, I could say that CBG is my second favorite, second favorite cannabinoid. Um, you could get, you could guess the first one. Um, but so, so here's another thing that you touched upon that would be interesting about this biosynthesis, right? Is right now, it's almost like we can consider the industry and how the plant is grown to be democratized, right? Anyone, you know, if we're going to quote, <laughs> I'm going to make a Pixar reference. Um, my kids are actually just a cover, so I can watch animated movies. Just like in Ratatouille, where anyone can cook, right? Right now, anyone can grow. Um, but if biosynthesis comes along and makes a dent in this industry for all the reasons that we talked about, you're potentially going from a market where anyone can grow to where these, uh, these companies initially in it, right, doing very, very technical things on patents, right? And then they have a leg up and it could, you know, potentially impact innovation um, and the market significantly. So that just occurred to me right now as we were talking it out as something else that would be an interesting thing to happen. And look, I'm an IP guy by trade, um, but you certainly appreciate this with the companies that you've been in, you know, the way that you know, IP plays out in an industry, um, whether it's say furniture um, or, you know, uh, or anything like cannabis or as we're seeing right now in psychedelics, the way that IP plays out and the way that early entrants can potentially cripple. I don't know if you heard that, there's someone zooming me because apparently I can't prevent that from happening. Um, but the you know, if they're, you know, it could potentially cripple innovation. So I think we're kind of seeing that with psychedelics right now. I'm trying to like, you know, coalesce this into a question. <laughs> so here's, here, I think I know what we're thinking. On that. There's, here's the, here's the, here's the paradox or what drives people crazy. And this can apply to the cannabis plant and it can 
can apply to certain psychoactive species of mycelium. It could apply to ayahuasca. It could apply to peyote, mescaline, 5-MeO-DMT. In other words, here we have uh, in God's great kingdom, or if you're secular in this incredible uh, garden that we live in. Uh, evolved by, garden. Evolved garden. We have um, incredible plants uh, that are public domain. They belong to the world, if you will. The cannabis plant, as we all know, you can't create IP around it. You could reformulate or synthesize or, or do things combined, but the actual plant is not, you know, it's public domain, as are the psilocybin in the wild, as is ayahuasca in the wild. And that creates, as we know, for capitalists, a vexing problem in that how do they innovate if they can't protect their innovation? They need to find a way to, if you will, design, redesign what nature has provided, probably in its truest, purest, and likely most bioavailable format into something that might be targeted specifically towards a condition like epidiolex, in which case, yes, that's that's quite good, but also might just be really, if you will, an ersatz or inferior product, but it comes with intellectual property protection. I, mm -hmm. I can patent on it. And so I feel like there's not that much innovation right now to go back, in, at least in the cannabis industry, those of us that are operating, you know, we're, we're really responding to market conditions in the here and now. And in terms of like, are we really, where, where we're innovating is, we're not so much innovating, I'm going to say, as we are adopting best practices that have served big ag very well, uh, or even like big other types of manufacturing. And we're sort of going from like a, um, less than fully efficient way to, if you will, grow our plants or process our plants to like a super more efficient. It will never be fully efficient until we break down all of these walls and barriers right now. I can even see some of the businesses that I'm operating or at least tasked to be chief executive we're forced to do more than we ought to, if you will. If you looked at the tomato industry, just as an example, you would say, well, you've got like in, you know, Salinas, California, you've got huge hectares of tomato farmers. That's their job is just to grow the crop. Then it's moved somewhere else for processing. That's that company's job. Then eventually it shows up as an input into, a, into Heinz ketchup on your supermarket shelf or in the tomato on your burger, whatever it may be. But there are sort of like steps along the way, each company's a specialist. So the farmer is, you got to assume it's a one, one harvest a year. They're as good as you're going to go, but maybe the processor has some unique skills in processing all the way down. I don't really see right now uh, that much innovation in the cannabis industry in the, in the truest sense. Truthfully, uh, I don't really think that the MSOs or the Canadian companies, they may be talking about it, but they're really they're focused on how to become profitable or how to max out their profitability. And they're probably not as obsessed with how to design the next gen of formulations or drugs. I would say that's where Big Pharma may be coming in a little bit right now. My point being that I don't think there is enough innovation in our industry and I'm thirsty for it wherever we can find it. I'm certainly not worried that biosynthesis is going to out innovate, if you will, the natural plant. I think that's just perfectly healthy. I don't also see biosynthesis replacing the natural plant. I'm going to argue that whatever comes out of that in some sense is inferior, period. But it may be when I say inferior, maybe it may not be as bioavailable or it may be like, yes, you've had um, some efficacy, but not as much efficacy as you would have had if you were able to get that isolated or that entourage effect from the plant. But what you will have is low cost and standardized inputs completely. And that will definitely play a role in the industry. But it also it's a cost benefit in exchange for lower cost and uh, standardized inputs. You probably get. I'm going to argue or predict, even though I haven't stuck my eye in a microscope and looked at it, uh, in some sense, an inferior result. Because I just think the plant is the magic. The plant is incredible. And I just feel that once humans start, if you will, reducing it or tinkering it or trying to copy it, they, they will come up with a good simulacrum. It'll be close, but it will be, it'll, it'll lack something period. I'm sure, I mean, the same way that, you know, beyond meat lacks something. <laughs> lacks the meat. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, no, I think that that's great, right? For a number of reasons, because like you said, you I mean, you refer to the entourage effect, right? The fact of the matter is that there is magic to the plant when it is consumed the way that God 
or uh, Charles Darwin um, designed it or, <laughs> or captured the idea of it in Darwin's case, right? So that, you know, the, the, these items, you know, this biosynthesis and how it's applied can possibly replicate that, right? And so what you're saying is, you know, it, we're talking about use specific use cases, right? Like these pharma and stuff where there's the added benefit of the capability to make consistent uh, large quantities of specific cannabinoids, right? That are harder to find in the plant naturally, right? And so what you're talking about though is, look, there's all the stuff where there's less innovation, but it's always gonna be a chunk of this market, certainly for recreational use, right? Like flour, different strains and all of that, right? But that's an even playing field because the, you can't really innovate along those lines that much. Um, but like, it's almost like we think about this as a supplement, right? These are different things that this biosynthesis is and the benefits of it by comparison to, you know, the plant growing are where it can be applied, right? Because I mean, it's just exactly like this is, it's not necessarily apples to apples competition, right? There is, I, I think that you're hundred percent right. And I, I hadn't like thought it through essentially that, you know, these cannabinoids coming out of this can't compete with a, as I like to say, the experienced users, the canisseurs, right? Who know the strains of the plant that they want to smoke. And that's the way that they're going to do it, you know? Um, so I think that that makes um, a lot of sense. Um, I, I, there's going to be a coexistence. There's no way biosynthesis obliterates. Just the way yeah. this, as far as I know, they still use grapes to make wine. <laughs> yes. Yes. Agreed. Um, yeah, no, I, uh, I, I completely agree. Um, so a little bit of kind of a related topic, right? Because we're touching um, on minor cannabinoids and we're scratching the surface and everything. And let's talk about how this has played out business-wise, right? In terms of, you know, post-farm bill, hemp is legal. Everyone's trying to make their money. Um, CBD, right, which you could get out of hemp in large quantities, uh, becomes a panacea, you know, and this anti-inflammatory qualities um, are applied to everything in the world and you do everything. And the FDA has limited capabilities. We're still waiting for regs from them in terms of ingestibles. Um, and so all of the CBDs there, then, you know, certain things tank in terms of the value of the hemp and everything. And where's the next pivot? Um, well, here's some innovation, right? People, uh, and in the way that it's mostly produced, right. Is Delta eight is coming from, you know, hemp, uh, deriving CBD from it, and then a chemical kind of conversion process. And now we have Delta-8. We have a psychoactive cannabinoid, I think typically considered 50% less psychoactive as Delta-9, and they're slapping it on products everywhere. And it's, of course, especially popular in states that don't have adult use. So, you know, Texas, 30 million people, they're incredibly... Uh, popular and profitable there. And then, you know, now they're fighting it in the courts when Texas subtly tried to make it explicitly illegal. Um, and all this is based on, you know, on this loophole. I mean, what people consider a loophole in the farm bill, every hemp is legal by farm bill. Anything that you could possibly get out of it is legal. And so once again, very long winded, I am it's not like us attorneys like to hear ourselves speak. Um, but, you know, to, you know, pass this off to you, um, you know, now you have all these, you know, that's the Delta eight's the first, you have Delta 10, you have HHC, you have all these ones that are going to be playing out. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of well, one in general about this and two, how you think it's going to play out, um, with these substances with the federal government at any point, we also have obviously the CDC, uh, FDA joint um, you know, um, warning about the 646 people hospitalized for, you know, Delta eight stuff. So throwing this out there for your thoughts, Paul, yeah, how do you I, think, how do you think about this? Hit and run capitalism. You know, it's like, there's a crevice of an opportunity. It gets filled in quickly. Um, it's sort of like, if you will, uh, end run or a hack around the, the overarching policy, which is, this is a controlled substance, but you do, this is the, the bizarre world we live in where there are little crevices to say technically, and this even goes back to biosynthesis. If I produce pure THC, but it's not from, it's from a mold spore. It's not from the cannabis plant. Is that a controlled substance? It, you read, read, it, it actually circles back to that. So you, you, 
assuming I'm a, an attorney as well, that, you know, policies are not like um, technocratic to the point of access to, to the point of assassinity, where they actually are serving a purpose. The purpose is this is a controlled substance. So I, I see the Delta eight stuff. Delta eight is fascinating. It's a great compound, but the idea that you can build a credible business in, without a, a, a state license and sort of like bring Delta eight you, you, it might be legally you can, but I just don't think it, you'll get shut down. Inevitably, it will get shut down sooner or later. I, I, I would predict or believe or even if it doesn't, it's the type of business that certainly I would not feel comfortable investing in or starting myself because it's um, I just don't think it's durable. And at some point, it's not going to be like it's a hack, if you will. I love the I love the creative entrepreneurial impulse that finds those hacks that's important to me it just points out the absurdity of the federal v state farm bill v ingestibles all of these discrepancies or dichotomies in u.s law and we only have these this type of weird like funky is delta eight you know, controlled or not because of the lack of harmony between federal and state laws and because the lack of certainty is just what does the fire bill really, really mean? There's like already 24 states, as you probably know, California included, where I am right now, where they basically now we have a version of hemp based CBD, not unlike the Controlled Substances Act, where California says it's OK to put hemp derived CBD in food and beverage. That's false. Yeah. Yeah. So we're we're all of this to me is not so much about innovation or about uh, about which cannabinoids are going to be popular it's, it's just sort of like this these weird little pockets of opportunity that come up because of the this this dichotomy between federal and state law let me tell you though as a person uh, that's you know invested in multiple cannabis companies and CEO and chairman of another one right now operating in the great state of Nevada, you know, we're really, we're, we're, if we think that there's profit in Delta eight and we can legally cultivate it, we're going there. If we think that CBN is going to be in demand in our products, we're going there. We're following the legal market, if you will, the state legal market. And to the degree that there are consumer trends that we need to pay attention to, which I can assure you in a very dynamic way, there are, we pivot. Basically, just to use 1933 as an example, just because it's relevant to me, you know, we have a 68,000 square foot cultivation facility. We have a 15,000 square foot lab. We have a choice. Every harvest, what do we make with the harvest? We can make flour in one eighth jars. We can make pre rolls. We can send biomass to the lab, and we can make infused pre rolls or vape cards, or we can make various isolates or distillates, dabs, shatters, waxes. This decision as to how, what do we take, how do we turn our crop into a variety of skews is all market driven. What's the price for flour right now? Has it crashed? What's the price for concentrates? Is it on the uptake? Where's our highest margin? Where's the highest demand? So we're constantly, I got to believe all companies in the industry are not yet so programmatic that they're looking at the market and the market can change in 90 days. You can see meaningful changes in the price of flour. It's almost like a live commodity auction. So we're always trying to figure out where's the highest valued use of our crop or our biomass. And we'll follow legally whatever the laws of supply and demand, wherever they take us. And if they, if CBN becomes an in-demand cannabinoid that consumers are looking to buy and will pay, if you will, a premium because it's scarce, we are going to do everything we can to respond to that consumer demand, but always in accordance with our license fully and you know, we have no choice, obviously. If I am in Texas and I'm, you know, live free and proud and I feel like I can play in that, you know, semi, is it, is it not? I have no problem with that. That's great capitalism and we'll let the market decide or the regulator decide. Certainly those of us that are operating with the license, we have to be, you know, holier than thou on all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And all, as usual, many, many super interesting points to bounce off there. And so one thing is you can't blame anyone in a capitalist society, right? When there are people are in business, there are people who are more um, comfortable with risk, right? And, you know, a lot of times that could mean quicker, larger profits, right? That could disappear tomorrow and those who are less, you know, willing to do it. But I kind of feel like if you're taking a really big step back 
to the total macro perspective as to why this is happening right now with Delta 8 and everything is a function of the fact that there is limited enforcement capability, right? The FDA has ridiculously limited enforcement capability when the most they can muster with everything that's going on with CBD is sending a couple of public letters, chewing out companies for saying things like as egregious as CBD will like cure Alzheimer's, right? So it's limited enforcement capability creates a, a chasm there. And the other thing is the difficulty in changing laws once they, you know, once they're passed, right? I mean, it's so difficult to get anything passed in Congress right now. We're in a midterm, you know, election coming up where Republicans smell blood in the water. And so when people are talking and you know, I'm playing Toker Damas for 2022, I have zero hope that safe banking passes because 10 Republicans won't give Dems, you know, potentially a win on that if the Dems wanted to. Right. So I see no progress, though Amazon behind the Mace bill was interesting. Um, though they endorsed the other ones from the Dems. Anyway, sorry. Um, but what I was going to say also there is, I think that there is an opportunity here because laws play out in unintended ways. If you had gone pre-Farm Bill passage, and the person that we have to thank for the Farm Bill passing is Mitch McConnell, right? I think most likely because he was trying to, <laughs> Mitch McConnell, trying to have a win for his farmers back home in Kentucky. If you had gone to him or any of the people on his side, or say most of the Democrats, any of the Democrats who uh, uh, signed off, and I don't remember the, the rate that was passed, and said, hey, you guys are going to sign this. And a couple of years down the road, people are going to take stuff, their interpretation of this and start cranking out psychoactive drugs uh, across the country. Do you think any single one of those senators would have voted for it at that no. point? No. Right. So, I mean, and, you know, we're both lawyers. I remember learning law school in terms of evidence for arguments, legislative intent, you know, but it's like, I think it's telling, right, in terms of, you know, how it's played out, why 20 states have explicitly said no. And why well, it's always funny that they're the states that zag. Uh, Florida, I'm learning, is a very unique place. Um, but, you know, super interesting how it's playing out. I mean, how do you think it potentially ends? Do you think that there is a bill passed that as part of some comprehensive legislation, or do you think it just kind of continues on in the wild, wild West with the only enforcement being on the state level? I mean, just curious if you have any thoughts. Dr. It, Thomas? It's um, I, I've whatever optimism I once had has been extinguished through the torpor of the U.S. political process. And my my new anthem is um, the classic Who ballad won't get fooled again. That's what I'm going to sing. Every time someone mentions safe state or more, I'm just going to be like, meet the new boss. <laughs> I, I, it's confounding, but I'm with you. I don't see any meaningful chance of any of this stuff passing until... 2020 post 2024 i actually unfortunately and um i do think that where this is ultimately gonna go though i think in the long run and i'm now talking i'm leaving the united states and i'm going to make a bold forecast is that we're going to end the we're going to find a path towards essentially doing what Portugal's done, which is decriminalizing all narcotics and treating addiction as a health issue, not a criminal justice issue, and realizing that the, prob the biggest problem of drug use is the fact that when drugs are illegal, it creates all sorts of mayhem around the fact that there's an insatiable demand for these compounds. There just is. Whether I personally don't recommend multiple types of narcotics, but they're, they're in demand. So People are going to do cocaine. They're going to take heroin. They're going to do these things. They are, in my opinion. And what we have to work as a society is towards um, minimizing the amount of people that will destroy themselves during that process and try to find a harm reductive approach. So I think, uh, and we're, I think this is going to happen in Canada in the next 10 years. There's multiple you know, chief medical officers of major cities and provinces saying there is no reason for any addict to be treated like a criminal. They need, be, need to be treated, if you will, like a patient. And there's no doubt that um, there is some 
like organized crime, if you will. I think I've watched too much Ozark in the last couple of nights. So I mean, it's Ozark. but that's available if and only if there's not an a uh, um, a alternative path for the consumption or purchase or cultivation of all of these in demand narcotics they they are i'm not saying that i want to have like on every corner you know uh fully empowered dispensaries selling everything you can imagine i'm kind of libertarian but not that libertarian i fundamentally believe government has a role here but i do think you you end up making whatever your policy is it's not being accomplished through prohibition it's not working unless the policy of prohibition was to impede the progress of the plant because it threatened the economic base of pharmaceutical companies or alcohol companies, which of course it partly was that, um, there's really no public policy that is advanced in support of prohibition. Unless, you know, you could be like, you're like, just say no, the Nancy Reagan kind of, and like everyone that, Fall, everyone that imbibes, if you will, is um, fallen prey to the devil and deserves whatever. Okay, this is craziness. This is just not normal thinking. So the truth is, I don't know what's going to happen in the United States. I just know that um, eventually uh, sanity will prevail. The war on drugs has been an epic failure. It's wasted tens of billions of dollars. It's incarcerated God knows how many minorities uh, disproportionately, inequitably, and it hasn't quelched demand that's the thing it has not quelched demand so there's such a better system in front of us right now which is to legalize or at least decriminalize regulate treat dispense what have you so i don't think anything is going to change in america for at least probably i don't even know i actually don't even want to make predictions anymore i'm also okay with the status quo because the truth is that it massively favors the incumbents, period. I can't imagine that you know, MSOs with uh, the big names, if you will, while I'm sure if safe passed, they would find that it could lubricate their source of capital. Uh, all in all, they're not that unhappy because they're running away from the field and they're really becoming too big to fail at a future date. Meaning that when, when the big industries that are so exactly. rolling this down are ready to come in and they will come in and then they'll tell their friends, the Senator and the governor, okay, we're ready now, uh, pass that legislation we want so we can come in. They'll have to, um, buy or build alongside us, not beat us. So, um, I do think that, uh, the status quo is not the most desirable, but it's also not the least desirable. Uh, what would be least desirable is, um, rescheduling cannabis as a, as a schedule two narcotic that potentially is um wildly chaotic for our industry because it would bring the fda into our grow rooms and i'm sure the fda has sops and standards that exceed whatever the state licenses are even though they're pretty rigorous i would say um descheduling if i believe a president can make that executive decision to deschedule yeah, uh, there there was some movement on that. I looked into it, right? People made a, a big deal about the Cory Booker and Elizabeth Warren letter, you know, pushing for that. And then I did a deep dive research and because um, it would have sidestepped, you know, Cory Booker's, were, it would have addressed social equity and everything. But then I looked, did a deep dive on it and that process of asking the president to do it via, you know, uh, the attorney general uh, has only happened a handful of times in the past. And the shortest time frame in which it did successfully happen was like six years. Right. There so you go. it seemed like this great thing and it got a lot of press. And I was like, mm, peel back the curtain, you know, really look not as, you know, promising as, you know, we would like, certainly. Exactly. Um, yeah. I, um, I mean, it, it's just fun to watch you play jazz, informational jazz on these topics, Paul. You know, I got to say it's great. So, I mean, I'm trying to think. So one, let's, I want to move over to one, and I agree with everything you said completely wholeheartedly. Um, and so one other topic that, you know, clicked in my head, right? That look nationally, um, that, I mean, it's a topic I just want to discuss with you and get your thoughts on is, you know, the regulated market, you know, kind of combating or trying to, you know, subsume, overtake the unregulated market, right? The legacy market that's been out of there. Uh, that's been out there for a long time. 
right? I mean, New York's coming online right now. You know, it's going to be a multi-billion dollar industry. There's already a billion dollar industry there um, that runs quite smoothly. And now that I'm interacting with some of the players in it who want to make their move over uh, really, really impressively. Um, and, and specifically, the main part of this is it clicked in my head that California and its complete, you know, failed attempt so far to try and, you know, combat its unregulated market. And to just very succinctly put it, in 2019, the estimates were that there are $9 billion worth of cannabis grown in California. Only five was sold in the regulated market. The other $4 billion was sold in state and probably greatly impacted, I mean, as it always has been, that the vast majority, I think, of unregulated cannabis in the country is grown in California and then shipped eastward. Um, that, impact, that impacts the regulated markets everywhere, right? Because that unregulated cannabis is out there not, you know, people aren't paying taxes on it, you know, it's undercutting prices and everything. Um, and so curious to know your thoughts about, you know, ways to address that, you know, maybe specifically in California or otherwise, just in general, want to hear your thoughts on that topic. That is such a uh, hot button uh, item right now, because it is uh, very much the, the case in California. There is something, there's these ghost distribution licenses, uh, which are like they're like they're like burner burner phone licenses. So it's oh, just, the provisionals, the provisionals licenses that are going to yeah. disappear in June. You use it till you get shut down. There's it's yeah. a well known that there are many licensed. It's just a fact here. This is not a, like uh, some weird rumor mongering. There's it's it's very difficult if you're in California to play by the rules and not go out of business right now. If you're a cultivator, it's plain and simple. Uh, the taxes, the 280E, and, and the black market has created unstable market conditions. And many of these companies are faced with an existential decision, divert to the black market go or go out of business. Okay, that's a pretty tough decision to make. Uh, is there a way for them to divert to the black market without threatening their golden ticket, their license? There most certainly is. That's where the burner distribution comes in. If the distribution license is, if it's licensed, the DC, a licensed entity can legally ship it to the licensed distributor, if you will. And that's a holy transaction. If the distributor then goes, if you will, with the license doesn't care what they do with it they then spray it out into the legacy market or ship it across eventually there'll be an audit the state auditor will say what happened to this product we're gone this the product is gone uh and it turns into cash and that cash flows back up the food chain that is happening all over california right now so here here's the book on this it's pretty straightforward of course the regulated market is the market that consumers should be purchasing from because it has authentication, third-party verification. You wouldn't go to the super, you wouldn't go, you know, there used to be an advertisement. I think um, Weed Maps put out an, an ad in like 2014 and it was really funny actually. I think this is the one they got Spike Jones to direct it. Uh, yeah. Maybe confusing, two different ads. But in this instance, the ad was, would you buy sushi from this guy? There's a guy in a parking lot. He's wearing a trench coat. And he's like, Psst, and he opens up the coat and there's like hanging like yellow tail, unog, whatever. But you wouldn't put anything in your mouth or on your body typically that wasn't subject to a food or safety audit. You would not. We just can't trust human beings to say, don't worry, we don't need the oversight. We'll, we'll never cheat because we respect our customer too much. No chance. Uh, eventually, you, not to say that you don't respect your customer, but it inevitably, I'm sure all that great market stuff or legacy market stuff isn't going through the type of testing that my product in Nevada goes through, where it's checking for like every possible pathogen. There's just not a chance. So as long as we create the massive extra costs of running a regulated entity while not prosecuting the cost advantage unregulated entity the unregulated entity is going to capture a big chunk of the market and for the government that's lost taxes for uh, the labor force that's lost jobs and for the patients and or consumers that's a risky transaction 
because they don't really know exactly what they're getting. Not to say that, you know, I think it's fair to say that, I, you know, I smoked like 14,000 kilos of cannabis from unregulated sources in my life. And here I am still to top condition and all. But still, it's better now when I know that there's no salmonella. It's better now when I know there's no E. coli in my product. It's better now when I know it's 17% THC without without not knowing. Okay, here's the thing, John. When prohibition ended, there was estimated to be something like 65,000 basement distilleries, stills, if you will. They didn't go away in year one or year two. It took, it took a couple of decades, but eventually only an idiot would buy their alcohol from a non authenticated source because it could be poisonous, if you will. And eventually only we will eliminate the, the, the preference for the gray market when we let the regulated market compete. The regulated market should be the winning market. It actually puts patient and consumer safety at the top of the stack, not profitability. That alone makes it the winning market. The, win, the winning market. We can innovate. We can take. We can combine our efforts with technology from other industries that are legitimate and improve upon our product. Just give us a fighting chance. Let the market decide. But right now, we are competing with one and a half hands tied behind our back. We cannot win that right now. So on a level playing field, of course, the regulated market is going to win. It's going to get all the consumption because only a fool would go off market at that point for what possible gain. Yeah. And, you know, you're, you're talking about how there's incentivization, like cycling back to the minor cannabinoids, you know, in a capitalist society, there are people willing to take risks. If you don't regulate it, someone's going to cut corners and do something unsafe, right? Exhibit A exam- example of what you're talking about was the vaping crisis, all the people whose lungs got wrecked and everyone bugged out in the industry initially. And lo and behold, what did we find? That it was all unregulated market. Some guy cutting corners, you know, what throat, throwing in what vitamin E acetate or whatever it was, and it tore people's lungs up and caused this, you know, health crisis, right? And where did that not happen? Right. And the regulated market, because of all the testing and stuff that you said, because of the standardization, because there's someone looking over and making sure that this is done properly. And I loved how the response from the regulated market was this is why you need a regulated market. This doesn't have this didn't happen here. Well, that actually it was even can I swear it was fucked up what the response was in Massachusetts. They banned vapes in the regular. Yes. Yep. Yep. The governor. That was this outlier and absolutely ridiculous, you yeah. know, a, a initial jerk reaction for political points. That was just bullshit. You, you are always welcome to curse here. I'm from Staten Island. It's like, um, you know, in my uh, in my genes, um, oh, that- I, you know. Yeah. Moment that should have been the moment when you know sensible minds in Washington said we have to immediately find a path towards this is the the exemplar of why we need to have a legal market right now yeah. because the legal market was safe the unregulated market was dangerous and solution ban the legal product <laughs> yeah that was yeah I, I just I came across that headline and for in the old articles I was like and it reminded me just of how you know fucked up it was when he did that. Um, and then the, yeah. And then, but, but so now it seems like certainly specifically in California, you know, that we're hitting a breaking point, which is why I made it one of my, um, you know, Toker for 2022 predictions is that something would actually happen in California because, you know, you had towards the tail end last year, you know, prominent business leaders in the state essentially calling for open revolt and not paying taxes. Oh. And the obvious thing to do, you alluded to it. The first thing that can make a difference here, and luckily Gavin Newsom already referenced it in his like uh, uh, earlier, like a week ago, is cut out the cultivation tax. Cultivators should not be paying taxes at that level, right? Ultimately, the taxes should be paid um, when the consumers are purchasing it, and you know, and you just that's where it makes sense, Um, and you know, it, it will be to everyone's benefit when the regulated market is dominant. And I think the ways to get there that I always like to say, I'm adding a third one now, are you know, killing them with convenience, price, or product diversification, right? And convenience is most everyone, since they're in the unregulated market, I mean, outside of now, there weren't storefronts, 
right? Everything was delivery. It came to you. Couldn't be more convenient than that. I remember the first time I was at my brother, uh, well, I shouldn't maybe say who, who it was, but at an apartment and the, um, uh, and the delivery guy came in New York city and he has this like one big bag and you're like watching a show on the TV and the dude just like sits down and is like kind of watching with you and then like opens up the bag and it's like you entered Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, right? And you got the golden ticket and he's pulling out all these, you know, glass boxes with different strains and everything. And so the rise of delivery is super important, right? On-site consumption, which we're in the early stages of the unregulated market will not be able to compete with. And that's a different type of convenience and destigmatization. You know, price, don't be stupid in terms of the tax construction, keep them low. And project diversification, right? Really, really good beverages, which I'm obsessed with as a member of the Cannabis Beverage Association. So um, that's um, what I was thinking. Oh, I, I realize we're hitting the end oh. of our allotted time. I don't know. Maybe we should wrap it up. I want you certainly to get the last word, um, you know, uh, with, with anything that you want to add, because uh, I know you're a super busy guy, which is why I'm going to, before I forget, thank you again for your time for this. But I can, this is my favorite thing. I think one of my favorite things is just to talk about this industry with other leaders like yourself and, you know, just, just have a conversation. And we, I'm going to say we barely scratched the surface. There's like, I know we we, we can, we can make this a, you know, we can have, there will be a part two, right. There'll be a part two at some point. Cause it was just that much fun. And like I said, like a high level, just everything you said is like gold, Jerry gold. Yeah. Um, but, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say I'm just gonna make a few a few bold predictions here, and then we'll, we'll wrap. Yep. Up. One is that uh, you'll be a podcast superstar. There's my first bold. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Hey, you're the real king of Staten Island. How about that? <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, you know, to all of the people out there that are in this industry, either they're new to the industry or they they've been at it for a long time, or they're feeling a little bit jaded at the moment, or cynical, or wondering where where's this all headed. Uh, this is all going to lead to a glorious outcome. I've, I've no doubt about it. And you have to kind of enjoy the process, enjoy the journey and see that we're all doing our part to contribute to the world that we want to live in. And the world that I want to live in is of course, suffused with kindness, empathy, compassion, decency, and supports entrepreneurship. And to the regulators, you know, we need you. Urgent to do your critical function. Only you can fulfill your mandate, which is to look after the citizenry, the citizenry that you are uh, tasked uh, with the honor of leading. And it should not be that 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 assignment should not be corrupted by corporate influences or by a political gerrymandering or by the fact that left and right don't want to give each other even an iota of a victory. There is something great happening here that you're impeding, which isn't, isn't even just the, the cannabis industry. It's the whole sort of, if you will, more ESG world that we want to live in right now. Those of us in the regulated market, it's frustrating. Uh, I'm not going to go open up a, a, a legacy uh, cultivation company, but like I said, it's frustrating because we're working so hard and so passionately. And we just find that the challenges that are in front of us uh, because of the, the all these asymmetries that you're referring to, uh, you know, we're, we're tough. We'll keep battling through it, but um, we could just use a level playing field. That's what we want. We're not at all concerned about our ability to add value to every major constituency. What do you want? Do you want safety for your citizens? We're good at that. Do you want good paying jobs with employee benefits and protections? We're good at that. Do you like taxes? We're good at that. So it's win, win, win. Social sure. equity, medical benefits. I mean, like the list, you know, the list goes on, right? In terms of what the positives that this brings. We're the best partner for that. We are your only partner for that in this right now. And the only reason that that isn't being sort of transparent and manifest is, if you will, corrupt influences, whether it's just the, 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 um, sort of stochastic nature of the U S political process or big business just not ready for it right now. But, 
we're ready to change the world. We need your help. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for ending on such an awesome, you know, awesome note, um, onward and upward. And, you know, what I, and thank you again for joining Paul. And I haven't done it for any of the interviews we've recorded already, but I think now is I'm going to do the customary Wolf Ferrell modified sign off. Uh, we're going to say to everyone, stay grassy. All right. And we'll uh, see you soon. Thanks again, Paul.